Sorry, I have a bit of a cold and from allergies, so I don't typically sound like this, just as a forewarning. Um, but okay, great. No. Oh, like this? Is that better? Oh, gracious! All right, that was really close. <clears throat> All right, well, happy Halloween. Um, and like Patrick. That I'm the social worker over at the Pat Summit Clinic. Um, I'm there five days a week. I see all of our families. Um, I provide support to the families, to the caregivers, to the patients, um, and to anyone who is really affected by dementia. Um, and so I am pretty excited to be there. Are you all able to hear me? You can't hear me still? Okay. Are we able to turn this up any? I can't get any closer. <coughs> It's on. Yeah, I was going to see if I could turn it up. I don't know if that turns it up a little bit. I think it's because I um, sound so hoarse. It's, it's, turn it up on the side. Is Sorry. it right here? Yeah. Oh, the numbers aren't moving. Okay, no, I don't think that's it. Is that any better? Yes. It is? Good. Okay, sorry about that. <clears throat> and like I said, if you all can't hear me at any point, it's just because of my voice and I might have to go grab some water. So just flag me down and let me know and I'll switch it up, okay? All right, so I'll go ahead and get started. Um, today I'm talking about self-care for the caregivers um, because that is just as important as taking care of the patients themselves. Uh-oh. Oh gosh, oh my gracious, okay. So, we'll go ahead and start with this. Um, I thought this was a very applicable cartoon. Um, and at the bottom it says, and do you take Goldie to be your lawfully wedded primary caregiver? Because that's, you know, what we're seeing these days. We're also seeing a lot of people whose spouses have passed away or, you know, they've gotten divorced and they're getting married later on in life. And they've been married for, you know, 10, 12 years, maybe seven. And then all of a sudden they're being thrust into the role of a caregiver. So. All right, so I really liked this quote from the Family Caregiver Alliance. Um, it's a difficult challenge to care for someone who is here but not here. Here physically but gone mentally and psychologically. You feel alone and in some ways you are. For many caregivers, it's as if there's a stranger in the house. So how many of you all can relate to this? Yes, so, um, and I've heard a lot of people say this, and so I run several support groups, and in one of my support groups, it's a frontotemporal dementia support group, and one of the wives was talking about how her and her husband have been married for 55 years, and he um, has FTD, and she's like, it's like I grieved the loss of my husband, and I learned how to love this new man that he's become, um, you know, which I felt was very touching and very true, and it's hard, but, you know, like I said, she is trying to look at it from a positive perspective, and I feel like that that's um, half of it, is just looking at it from a positive perspective and trying to basically take care of yourself and like that. All right, so feelings among caregivers. How many of you all are caregivers or were caregivers or at some point? Okay, so quite a few of you. All right, so <clears throat> I listed out some feelings. Uh, what feelings do you all have while caregiving? Do any of these? Resonate with you? All of the above. All of the above. <laughs> okay, yeah. Is there anything that I don't have on here that you all feel like is important or no? The main ones that I think are probably, or at least the ones that the families talk about with me a lot, are guilt, anger, stress, frustration, feeling overwhelmed. I think that's probably one of the key ones. Um, and but I mean all the rest of these as well. Um, I don't think that probably the bottom three are discussed as much. Fulfillment, love, and satisfaction. And you all all obviously feel love, or else you wouldn't be doing what you do. Oh, you go. Ahead. So, I'm not at the point of being a caregiver per se yet, but um, my mother, who is 90, was diagnosed with early stage dementia mm -hmm. about a month ago, okay. and the one feeling I have that is what? Helpless. Helpless. Right. Helpless. Right. 
right? And that's a, that's a great feeling. I should definitely add that. That's very true. A lot of people do feel helpless. You have been used to being in control and fixing things. You know, if you go to the doctor and you're told that you're a diabetic, there's things that you can do for that. You can give them insulin, you can change your diet, you can change your exercise. But with dementia, that's not the case. You're helpless, it's gonna keep going no matter what. And there's nothing that you can do to make your loved one back to the way they were. So I think that's great, that's great. Is there anything else that you all? Sorrow. Sorrow, that's a good one too. I mean, it's sad. You know, a lot of people focus on the patients, but you know, it's just as hard on the family members when their loved ones are diagnosed with um, you know, uh, any illness, but especially dementia. So, I mean, it's sad. It's sad. You're grieving the loss of your loved one. So, that's great. Any other ones? And so, like I said, for the fulfillment, love, and satisfaction, you all obviously are all amazing people, and you all loved your loved ones no matter what. But I know it's hard all the time to feel the love and to feel the fulfillment and to feel the satisfaction. I know a lot of times it's probably more of these other things like the guilt, you know, leaving them at home alone or, you know, having, needing to go to work and leaving them with a stranger, leaving them at an assisted living facility. You know, a lot of things come with caregiving. You all are all amazing people, but it's tough, it's tough. All right, so what is caregiver stress? A little bit more in depth about this. Um, emotional and physical toll of caregiving, significantly higher stress than those who are not caregivers, which I think you all can probably all relate to, uh, feeling like you're on call. So the work never stops, especially if they live with you. Um, you know, it's like you have two full-time jobs if you are still working. You work out of the house 40 hours a week and then you come home to your second job that you can't escape. I mean, it is a 24-hour, seven-day-a-week thing, and it's tough. It's tough always being on call and never having that time off. Um, unable to do what you enjoy and role reversal. So that's a tough one. <clears throat> You're always used to being probably the child or the wife, um, and then all of a sudden with dementia, things get changed. So now all of a sudden your parent that has always been your mom or your dad for so long, now you're more in a parental role and they're more in a child role. Same with a husband and a wife. Um, you know, I think a lot of people probably have the most difficult time with that is that you've always been in this loving spousal relationship where it's 50-50 or you all work together as a team and now all of a sudden your spouse is transitioning more into a child role where you're the parent. And that's hard, and that's hard, especially if you're not talking to anyone and it's just you taking care of them and you don't have any support. So it's difficult, it's difficult. It's a new attitude that you have to take on and new roles. So the risk factors. I don't think these are probably that surprising. So women, you know, women are most likely to be the caregivers, sisters, daughters, wives, whatever that may be. Um, Living with the person that you're caring for, like I had said a little bit ago, be, never being able to get away, never being able to leave the house, never being able to clock out, not having a choice. I think that's probably pretty self-explanatory, but if something, if it's your husband and you all have no children, or if it's your parent, you have no siblings, or there's no one else to take care of them, or you all have no money to send them somewhere, it's hard. You have to take care of them yourself. Financial strain taking care of all of a sudden someone else's bills along with your bills, especially if the loved one or person with dementia um, is a spender. I'm sure we can all, we all know a couple spenders, um, you know, like where they watch QVC, they still have access to their credit cards or they look through magazines and then all of a sudden they're ordering all this stuff and you all are getting thousands and thousands of dollars or hundreds of dollars of stuff delivered to your house every day. Um, I deal with this a lot. Um, you know, and that's hard. Get, taking away someone's financial freedom is difficult, but it's especially difficult if you're paying the bills. So, all right. Um, depression, isolation, I think that that's really a big one. Feeling socially isolated, being depressed. Um, you know, you're physically isolated, you're not able to leave the house, you have to arrange for a caregiver. Sometimes no one's available and it's just you. And it, sometimes you just get sucked into just being at home all the time. And that's hard and that's tough. That's tough. 
number of hours spent caregiving, and then challenging family members. I think we can probably all relate to that too, is sometimes your loved one doesn't want to do what you want them to do. Um, <laughs> that's probably an understatement. You know, you want them to take a shower, they don't want to. You want them to change clothes, they don't want to. Or leave the house, you know, get out for a walk, and they don't want to. So it's hard, it's hard. But those are all risk factors for um, caregiving stress. All right, so signs of caregiving stress. Weight fluctuation. You know, a lot of times I think that this kind of creeps up on people. Um, you know, it, usually it's subtle changes in your eating habits. You know, you don't have enough time to go home and make a meal, so you just swing by McDonald's. And then all of a sudden it's a month later and you've been swinging by McDonald's every night. Um, or you're just not eating at all. You know, I know that a lot of new parents go through this and a lot of caregivers go through this too, is that you get so busy taking care of your loved one and you're handling all these different things that it's nine o'clock and you realize that you haven't eaten and you're like, you know what? I don't need to eat this late anyway. I'll just, you know, I'll be all right. I'll just go on and go to bed. And so we can't let that happen. Um, <laughs> Sadness and depression, unusual sleep patterns, Alcohol and drug use, you know, I think this goes without saying, but I know it's hard. Sometimes you're just like, oh, you know, one glass of wine, that's not gonna hurt anything, it'll take the edge off. Just try not to let that get out of control. That will definitely make everything worse. Um, exhaustion, body pain, you know, stress causes pain. It causes aches, it causes headaches, it causes all kinds of physical pain that you really don't realize that you're having. Um, feeling overwhelmed, a loss of interest in doing things that you usually like to do, um, an inability to make decisions. I think we've all been at that point where we're so stressed, we have so much going on, that we're not able to make decisions about things that usually would be pretty easy to do, especially if we're still working. I know that a lot of times, a lot of families report this to me, if they're at work, then they're not able to make decisions that they usually do on an everyday basis. But most of all, it's okay to feel the way you do. And I think that that's hard for a lot of people. It's like going back to the guilt, you feel guilt and ashamed that you're frustrated with your loved one or they're you know, annoying you today or whatever that may be or that you, know, you missed going out with your friends or you missed going out with your husband or your family member because you had to stay home and take care of them. It's okay to feel frustrated. It's okay. And sometimes I think people just need to hear that it's all right. You know, these are all very normal, common feelings to feel this way. So however you feel, it's not wrong. So just try to remember that, but I know it's a lot easier said than done. <clears throat> I thought this was pretty accurate. Um, it's your life being squeezed. Over to the left is your parents, and they're pressing the vice, and then to your right are your kids, and then in the middle, that's you. And you're basically being taken from every angle but you're not able to take care of yourself. So, all right. I also don't think that people realize how many responsibilities that you truly have. You know, I know a lot of times we get in the habit of doing things and in the swing of doing things, and so you're, you're just on autopilot, but you all have a lot going on. You know, there's personal things with your husband, kids, wife, friends, church, your animals, if you're big into animals, any other community organizations that you're involved with, if your kids do sports, if you do sports, if anybody does sports still. Um, you know, I mean, there's a lot going on, plus work, that's at least 40 hours a week typically, and then a lot of people end up taking at home. Um, caregiving, which is a 24 hour a day job, and then daily tasks like cleaning, cooking, eating, taking time for anything. That's a lot on your plates. Like I said, a lot of people don't realize how much you truly have going on because you don't sit still long enough or take time enough to sit there and actually think about it. <clears throat> okay, so these are some statistics that I found pretty interesting. So, more than 34 million unpaid caregivers provide care to someone age 18 and older who has a disability. That's a lot. Half of caregivers who said that their health has gone, gotten worse due to caregiving also said that the decline in their health has affected their ability to provide care. So of the caregivers or people you all know that are caregivers, how many of them has their health kind of gone downhill some? Because they're not taking time for themselves. 
They're not going to the doctor's office. They're not going to the dentist. They're not, you know, if they if their knee hurts, they're not taking time to go to the doctor because they'll power through and they'll make it work. Caregivers said that they do not go to the doctor because they put their family's needs first or they put the care of the recipient's needs over their own, which is what I was just saying. So it happens and it's very easy to do. More than half said that they do not have time to take care of themselves and almost half said that they are too tired to do so. You know, at the end of the day, after you manage everything that you manage, you all survive the day because sometimes, let's be real, that's the goal, is just surviving the day. You're just too tired. You're worn out and you're like, you know what, I'm just going to go to bed. I have a cough, I have a cold, my knee hurts, but it'll be okay tomorrow. I'll take care of it then and then you never do. <clears throat> so, how can we prevent burnout? What are some things that you all do to prevent burnout? Exercise. Exercise. That's a great one. That one relieves stress and takes care of yourself at the same time. So that's key. Come here. Come here. <laughs> that's great. <laughs> yes, coming here. Um, listening and hearing about how you're not alone and listening to more information. So that's great. Anything else? Have a creative outlet. Have a creative. Do something new. Yes. Yes. That's wonderful. That's wonderful. Like art or some kind of hobby. Okay. Music. Music. Yes. Music that's coming up next, which should be pretty exciting. So, caring for yourself, doctor's appointments, like I kind of already talked about, getting away, respite care. I think that that's a key thing that not a lot of people take advantage of. A lot of the agencies here in Knoxville provide respite care um, and, the and the surrounding counties. There's people who can come into your house that can sit with your loved one for a little while or you can take them to an assisted living or a nursing home, wherever that may be. They can go there for respite for up to two weeks. So if you all need time off, you need to go on vacation with your family, you need to step away, there are services out there. And if you all need any more information about that, then you, know, you can always contact me. I'm happy to help. There's Alzheimer's Association, Alzheimer's Tennessee. The Bat Summit Foundation can get you in contact with me. Whatever that may be, if you all need a break, seek help and go ask someone because there are services out there. There are people here. So support groups, talking with friends, hobby, um, religion, adult day facilities. There's also adult day facilities. So there are like adult daycares where you go take your loved one for the day. Usually they're open five days a week and they're there, you know, eight hours a day. So a lot of people will take their loved one there if they just need some, like short term break during the day or if they need to go to work. A lot of them pro provide transportation. You know, they are wonderful things. So take advantage of these resources that are in our community. And we have several here in Knoxville and several in the surrounding areas. Um, in home assistance, that's what I mentioned earlier too. There's trained people, there's lots of caregiving agencies in the area and they are trained. They all have background check checks and these agencies um, have insurance. And so they can come to your house, they can help your loved one run errands. If you wanna stay at home and you want your loved one to maybe leave, they can help them go to doctor's appointments, they can help them do anything. They can also sit at home with them, even if it's just simple as watching TV. Sometimes that's all you need. It's just a couple of hours to go upstairs and to just sit there with nothing and just sit there. And that's what they provide. Um, they also do light housekeeping. So like they'll do the dishes or change the bed and um, just little things like that. So they are very helpful. And most importantly, asking for help. You don't have to do this alone. I know that a lot of people feel like that they do. I get a lot of families telling me, well, my mom took care of me. I have to take care of them. I feel like a failure if I can't take care of them all by myself. And that is not how it needs to be. This is why we have these resources is to help you, is to help everyone who is a caregiver. You don't have to do it alone and you don't have to get to the point where your health is hurting or where you know, you're so stressed out that you're about to have an anxiety attack. You don't have to do that. So reach out for help. You know, There's lots of agencies, like I said, and if you ever need to, you can also contact me at the Pat Summit Clinic too. <clears throat> so they asked me for um, a little information on preparing for the holidays. 
So since I know that that's coming up, that's a hot topic these days. So holidays are a little different when you have someone with dementia, right? Um, it's not like it used to be. It's not how, you know, if it was your mom with dementia then, or your wife with dementia, they're all of a sudden not running the entire day. They're not cooking all the meals. They're actually, you know, having a more difficult time with it and might be acting out a little bit more. So I thought it might be nice to kind of talk about some tips and some tricks. So planning ahead. You can be in control of the day. You know, plan ahead, keep your loved one informed. Let them know when people are coming, what you all are eating, when you're eating. Try to have your meals a little bit earlier in the day um, instead of, you know, at seven o'clock at night. Earlier in the day might be a little bit easier for them. You know, if they take naps, take naps, you know, plan around a nap schedule. Let them know what family members will be there and try to stay in your usual routine. And I know that that's tough, staying in your typical routine when you have 20 family members coming in or you need to run to like three different houses. Try to stay in your usual routine as much as you can and try to, like I said, just keep them informed and aware of the plan. Uh, Self-care, be sure to take care of yourself. I think the big thing here is, is the holidays are stressful no matter what. They're even 10 times more stressful when you have someone with dementia and someone that you love. So if someone invites you to a holiday party and you're not able to take your loved one, you should try to go. You know, go have fun. Go do something for you. You deserve it. You all are in the trenches every day. You all are out there taking care of them. You all deserve to have a good time. So go to that party. Um, preparing your loved one, which is kind of what I already talked about. Show them pictures of who all's coming and kind of give them outline of the day. Prepare your family. I think that that's a key thing that not a lot of people think of doing. Um, you know, give them an honest assessment of how your loved one's doing. Let them know that, well, you know, mom's not recognizing as many people as she once was, or, you know, she's not exactly with it today, or she's had a bad week, so just be prepared. Just give them an honest assessment of what's happening. I think that that's important. <clears throat> Involve everyone in the activities. Plan some activities so things don't get awkward and so they're not just all sitting around staring at them. You know, I know a lot of times when we go visit people or when we go see family members, there's a lot of sitting around and it's a little uncomfortable. I mean, let's be honest. So try to plan activities, leave out photo books, memoirs, scrapbooks, games, you know, simple games that you know that they can still play. I mean, try to coordinate it so there's no awkwardness. I'm gonna grab some water. <clears throat> okay, sorry. Communicate. You know, try to, this goes along with too, of pre in preparing your family. Let them know that they don't need to be talking super fast. They don't need to ask two questions at a time. One question at a time is sufficient. Give the person pro time to process and time to think through the answer. Smart gift giving, which I think this is a really great point. Um, you know, try to give practical items like easy to slip on clothes, you know, things without a lot of buttons, easy to slip on shoes, um, things that they would actually need. Um, I wrote down a couple of other things like clothing, videos, photo albums, making their favorite food, making their favorite dessert if they're able to do it, you know, probably nothing electronic, you know, nothing that's going to be too high tech where it's just going to sit there. So try to be smart about your gift giving. Um, safe home environment. Try to clear out the space and so there's not a lot of clutter and everyone's able to move around. I think this also goes along the lines of your decorations. Try to be mindful of that too. Things with a lot of lights or a lot of moving parts can be very distracting and can be very difficult for the person with dementia. So try to keep that in mind. Just try to simplify as much as you're able to. Travel wisely. You know, never leave your loved one alone in a strange area, obviously, um, and use transportation that they're used to. So if you all go to a big city, try not to take the subway. Try not to do things that they aren't necessarily used to. Try to take cars or a bus if you feel like that they're going to be okay with that. It's very difficult on them for even just the change of routine, but going in, on to something that they're not used to going on, it really can trip them up and mess them up. Um, Find sources of support. 
you know, that goes back to your friends, your family, you all can call Alzheimer's Association, Alzheimer's Tennessee, go to a support group. Um, you know, that's very, very important. And then when your loved one lives in a facility. So I know that we have several people who live in assisted living or nursing homes, and that's difficult because you don't know whether you need to pull them out, whether you need to leave them there. That's up to you all, but try to really go on where that person is. So if they're in a nursing home and it's very confusing for them to leave, I would probably just leave them there. Go visit them there. Take their favorite food. Take their favorite holiday dessert. Take their favorite book or story and some photo albums and try to participate in the uh, facility holiday parties. A lot of the places have holiday parties, <clears throat> sing-alongs and all kinds of fun things. Try to go participate there and then you can have your own holiday parties at home later on. So, all right. Okay, so managing difficult behaviors. So, I don't know how many of you all have loved ones that wonder, but that's hard. Um, you know, they leave the house without you knowing in the middle of the night, or you take them to the grocery store, they're right behind you, you reach to grab the bread, you turn around, and all of a sudden they're not there. Um, that's hard, and that's scary. So some ideas to kind of man how to manage that is reducing the stimuli at home. Um, you know, like with knickknacks, clutters, you know, a lot of different things laying around. Kind of try to reduce that and streamline that. Um, curtains or signs on the doorways. I know this sounds super simple, but it actually works. If you can put a stop sign on the door, that's one of those things that people, when they see stop signs, it doesn't matter how old they are, they typically stop. Um, so just things like that. Curtains on the doors is nice because they think it's just a closet. And so a lot of times they won't pull back the curtain and try to go back out the front door. So um, locks that are difficult to reach or open, you know, things that are really high or really low. Um, exercise. Um, a lot of people don't realize this, but sometimes wondering can be prompted through not getting a lot of exercise and being restless. Sometimes they just have this intrinsic need to go out and exercise and to go move around. So if you maybe try to help them walk around the neighborhood, um, you know, do some light exercise in your house, whatever it is that they enjoy, try to go do that and that might actually help curb some of the wandering. There's also something that I didn't put on here, but there's GPS devices. Um, there's a really great program called Project Lifesaver. It's here in Knoxville and in a lot of the surrounding areas and it's completely free and it's through the Sheriff's Department. <clears throat> and it's this little GPS tracker that they wear and then if, say, they get lost or something like that, if they wander from home and you, don't, you can't find them, you don't know where they are, you can call the Sheriff's Department and they'll track them for you and you can go. So um, there's several different GPS devices. Some of them go in your shoe, some of them go on a bracelet, some of them go on a necklace, whatever that may be. Those are you know, definitely options, especially with this day and age. So they're very great. And again, if you need any more information on that, definitely let me know. And seek medical attention. I think that that's probably a pretty common one. You know, there are medicines available to help them sleep more and to kind of help, you know, take them down and calm them down a little bit. Okay, so aggressive behaviors. I don't know how many of you all have, um, you know, loved ones that all of a sudden they're mean. You know, your mom and or your wife or your parents used to be the sweetest little people ever, and now all of a sudden they're cussing and, you know, being hateful and telling people that they're fat or whatever that may be. It's hard. <clears throat> it's embarrassing for you, and it's just and it's embarrassing for the person that it's happening to, and it's just difficult. It's hard to manage. So a lot of times, you know, if someone's getting upset, try to redirect the conversation. You know, if you see that, you know, your mom is getting upset with your brother, and be like, oh, mom, you know, I lost my watch. Could you come help me find it? And try to redirect the conversation into something else. Um, typically, with redirection and dementia, it often works. And so sometimes, though, you just have to be pretty creative about how that works or how that happens. Um, <clears throat> Routines, I think that's probably one of the most important things. You know, just like small children, you know, they're on a routine, they eat at this time, this time, this time, they nap at this time. Older adults are the same way with dementia. You know, they need to have their routine, they need to be on a solid track. 
And so throwing off the routine really just messes up everything. Um, stay grounded, stay calm. I know it's hard. Um, talk in positive, non-threatening body language. You know, face them straight on. Don't talk to them from behind. You know, remain calm. A lot of what people perceive and understand comes from your facial expressions. So, you know, if, you, if they can visually tell that you're upset, that you're probably not gonna get a lot of places. But if you calm your face and talk, you know, to them directly and quiet, uh, softly, you know, don't yell, then, you know, a lot of times you can get pretty far. Limit distractions. You can always seek medical attention if you feel like it's on a whole nother level and you're not able to control them, then you can always seek medical attention. Call your doctor's office, see if there's anything you can do. Um, and then there's also inpatient facilities that can help out as well if you really feel like that they're out of control. And most importantly, don't argue. Now this is the most difficult one, so I'm gonna say it again, don't argue. It is so hard not to argue with your loved one, right? I mean, when you've been married for 50 years or they're your parents and they're like, I know I left my keys right here. And you're like, no, you didn't. You hung them on a hook. No, I know I left them right there. You moved them. I didn't move them. You did. No, no, no. I mean, and it goes on and on. And the next thing you know, you're in a full blown argument. Try not to argue with them. <clears throat> it doesn't matter if they say that the sky is purple. Just say, you know what, you're it's a beautiful shade of purple today. You're correct. Or something. It doesn't matter. As long as it doesn't hurt their safety, then just try not to argue with them. Um, but again, I know that that's difficult, especially if you've been married for forever. Um, but just try not to argue. <clears throat> Unless it's life-threatening, then of course, try to redirect and change things around. All right, so planning ahead. Have power of attorneys and living wills readily available and completed. Before your loved one, you know, if you have the ability to, before your loved one gets far enough along in their progression, get a living will, get something in writing. Um, you know, we give them away for free at the hospital. They're called Five Wishes. You can find them free online. If you all have a lawyer, you can go to the lawyer's office and get a power of attorney or living will drawn up that way. I would prefer that way. It's a little bit more, it's a lot more involved and better. But you know what? If you're not able to afford a lawyer, then that's okay. There are lots of options online that you all can do. Just try to get something in writing um, because if you wait too long and there's nothing, then it's going to cost you a lot more in legal fees, especially if your loved one is obstinate. Who will care for your loved one if something happens to you? Try to have a plan in place. You know, have that family member who knows that they will take over if something happens or have an assisted living planned out. A lot of my families at the clinic have an assisted living picked out that they've already gone and talked to the assisted living. Whereas, you know, if they happen to fall, if something happens, like they break a hip or they break an arm or if they get sick, have a heart attack, it doesn't matter what it is, then they have a plan in place. And I think that that's always a good thing to do. Make sure your family is involved and informed. Unfortunately, I see way too often when families are coming in and they're not on the same page. You know, the power of attorney has all of the information in their hands, but the family has never seen this, and so they're like, oh no, you know, mom wants everything done. Mom would never want to be in assisted living. She would never want a feeding tube, you know, all this stuff. And then we're like, well, actually, you know, if you look at her living will and power of attorney, then she's laid out exactly what she wants. It, this solves a lot of arguments at the end when you all don't need to be arguing. You all just need to be there focusing on your loved one. So try to keep everybody informed and on the same page, especially when it comes to power of attorneys too. If you have a power of attorney or your loved one has a power of attorney, make sure the rest of the family knows who the decision maker is. Sometimes they don't tell anyone and that can also lead to some conflict. Um, elder law attorneys. There are a lot of elder law attorneys here in Knoxville. We're very fortunate to have that. Um, they are certified in elder law, so they can help you all plan out um, finances, trust, everything else that you might need. So um, they are here and available and pretty awesome. All right, so for final consideration, if you don't take care of yourself, who will be there to take care of your loved one? And I know I already kind of touched on that in the first place, but I cannot stress this enough. 
When you're a caregiver and you're taking care of every single other person, every single other aspect in your life but yourself, you're setting yourself up to get hurt or to get sick or for something to happen. <laughs> your main goal is to take care of your spouse, your mom, your dad, your loved one, whoever it may be. If that's the case, then you have to take care of your loved one because if you don't, or you have to take care of yourself because if you don't, and something happens to you, then there's not going to be anybody there. And they're not going to take care of them the way that you do, the way that you love them and the way that you care for them. So just be sure to try to take care of yourself. <coughs> okay, resources and support. I kind of already talked about this, but there's Alzheimer's Tennessee, Alzheimer's Association. We're very lucky to have two places here in Knoxville that both specialize in Alzheimer's and research and that are readily available to help you at any time. <coughs> Um, the National Institute on Health, they have a lot of great articles if you ever want any information on that. Uh, support groups, there are tons of support groups in the area. And when I say tons, there's like over 30. So reach out to someone, reach out to Alzheimer's Association, Alzheimer's Tennessee, find a support group that's near you. They're in all the surrounding counties and in Knoxville. So, um, you know, reach out to someone if you feel like you need to talk to others. Uh, counseling services. If you decide that you need some one-on-one -on -one counseling, then that's okay. Definitely reach out to someone there. Um, and then there's also Purple Cities. I just like to include Purple Cities because I think it's a pretty cool thing. Knoxville was the very first dementia-friendly certified town. Um, basically, we did training with a lot of, there's Purple Cities organization. They did training with all of the downtown organizations with the police department, fire department, EMS basically anybody, all of the public service and a lot of the businesses to train them on how to better help and um, handle a dementia patient. Especially if someone looks like they're alone and confused or lost, they're not going to automatically call the police or assume that they're drunk. I think that that's, you know, the big issue with dementia patients is sometimes they don't have a clue where they are. If they're in a store, they wandered away from you, you can't find them. And then someone else just assumes that they're drunk if they start backing up or aren't communicating with you. And that's hard. So they were all trained in this. So it's pretty cool to be from Knoxville. So, and then there's some references. So that's it for me. Um, do you all have any questions for me or anything that I can answer, anything that I can do for you? Yes. I'm sensitive to this because I'm a minister. But if you have a minister, ask him to come and read from Psalms and pray with them. Okay, yeah, 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 absolutely. And you know, there's a lot of, um, speaking of ministers, there's um, several chaplain trainings going on as well. I don't know if you're familiar with those as well, but yes, no, that's great. Thank you. He said to read from Psalms if you're a minister, or I'm sure you all probably heard him, uh, a minister, and that's very helpful. So that, thank you. Thank you. Anything else? Questions? Anything? Sorry I sound like this. No. All right. Well, thank you all very much. And let me know if you need anything, okay? Thank you.